uh, in theory, the MedComs community should be better placed than many groups uh, uh, to, to work from home, uh, as many of us already do this uh, all the time or part of the time. But does the evidence actually bear this out? Uh, Tim Hartman from Niche Scientific, uh, Peter and myself, decided to investigate this by means of an online survey during the early part of lockdown. Uh, some of the data was presented in a webinar uh, in the summer, uh, and an article will be appearing in this month's medical writing uh, with our final results. Uh, the data presents a number of contradictions. Uh, I'm now going to call on Tim to provide an overview of the results, uh, and then afterwards, uh, Rob Davis from Havis will briefly discuss the paper. Uh, Tim, over to you, please. Okay, just share my screen. Hopefully, sure. and go here. And here, sorry about that. Right, so um, just a little bit of background behind this. I've only got 10 minutes and there's rather a lot of data. So originally when I started Niche 22 years ago, uh, my, my theory was that everybody would be able to work from home and uh, it would be great. We could work it from a virtual office and there would be no consequences, no rent, lots of low costs. And uh, I think probably around about 2002, in our, uh, in our arrogance, we, we did an analysis uh, that was, was published at, at uh, some meeting somewhere, I can't remember, many years ago. But we did an analysis that showed that even in those heady days that uh, for working from home created uh, a positive cost benefit to um, to our employees and actually to the, to the company itself, which was as might be expected and what was the idea. However, as, as years went by, I started to have more and more members of our staff express things that we might call um, mental health issues. And I started to be a little bit worried about this and uh, probably around about 2005, we completely changed our model. It, it was not serving our employees well, it was not serving our clients well. And we, we went more to a, uh, an office-based setup, although people were allowed to work from home um, on, on an as, as needed basis. So I've never particularly been a big uh, fan of the process of um, demands that people be completely allowed to work from home as you employ new people. Uh, I do think that it's something that's pushed by employment agents uh, who seem to think that it's it's a, a great thing and it is, but I do think that it needs to be done carefully. And when we had the lockdown uh, earlier this year, it came to me that this was an ideal opportunity to just test, just to have a look to see if um, it did actually have any effect on people. And I realized that this is a, a bit of a, a false uh, study because obviously they were isolated in many different ways, but this is what we decided to do. And I, I worked with Peter and with Stephen to set that up. Uh, we looked at the working home from home environment, to emotional well being, self worth, work lifestyle, and opinions of where they, you know, what they thought about working from home. And you may have been person that uh, answered, replied to the, uh, to the survey, we had just under uh, 800, which was, uh, was, was really quite good. I was very pleased with that. Uh, as you might be able to see from the distribution, uh, we did have an awful lot of ladies answering, not as many men, uh, but they were pretty, most of, most of all, they were in really stable environments. They, they had homes, they were you know, a little bit older, um, and most of them were based in the UK. And at the time of the survey, we had 97.4% of respondents were working from home. Uh, strange, I'm not quite too sure who wasn't working from home. And effectively, if you cut down the data, we don't really have a great deal of time to look at the data. You, you could, um, people felt they were well informed with the jobs that they needed to do. They were enjoying the freedom of being able to work from home. Um, there was, uh, the majority did feel that they did, weren't losing training opportunities, but if you take a look, there's about a quarter there that uh, that actually did feel that they were losing opportunities, and then people still felt they had the space to grow. Um, everybody felt more or less that they had the, the equipment to do it, and that's what, where you have one of the first uh, 
discrepancies start to appear. And one of the things that really, really worried me indeed was the fact that eight, over 80% had not filled any form of health and safety assessment. And I, I think this is something that the industry really has to get a hold of, even if you're a self-employed person. Uh, and Peter and I can both tell you from personal accounts that this can go wrong. This can go very wrong. So emotional well-being, you know, if you look at the, the distribution of the data, everybody was feeling particularly cheerful and well. But again, you look a little bit closer, people were feeling as though they were getting less sleep. They were not quite as excited and full of energy. But everybody was commenting, you know, that uh, we were getting a lot of emails from people saying that it's great working from home. And uh, they were desperate to find out that uh, to sort of reinforce this belief that working from home was the, the universal panacea. However, look a little bit closer. We had nearly 30% uh, had comments about uh, answered their responses that they felt lonely or isolated at some point. Now, again, this is a false study because people were isolated. And uh, but within three weeks, uh, of the lockdown, we were starting to get responses on this and uh, it, it, it has to be of some concern. And again, you know, we had good value, people were feeling valued, engaged and um, getting the recognition that they needed, but not everybody. And I, I presume you expect a certain distribution, but uh, as an employer, the question is, you can't discard, you know, a quarter of your workforce because they're not feeling happy. And effectively, the discrepancy here was um, that we, what we actually did was we, we actually put some free text in and uh, we asked people for their opinion. And one of the opinion pieces is whether they felt work would ever return to normal. And it was strongly felt that work would never, ever return to the normal way of doing things. But uh, we had 41,000 words of responses uh, to our free text questions, which took, as you might imagine, quite a little while to work through. And uh, despite the fact that probably 28% of, of uh, our responders had some issues that you might, might relate to not, not good mental position to be in, everybody was insanely positive about how it's really good. But the only other issue was if you're looking at what you might suggest to your employer uh, in terms of ways that uh, it could improve, the issues were around personal issues. I, you know, uh, I, I need to have a double screen. I need to have a good chair and, and not really about the business itself. And effectively, it seems that everybody's very positive about uh, about working from home, but a lot of people who work for employers feel that uh, somehow the the employee or employer is responsible for solving the employee's questions. And I think this brings us back to, um, you know, what is the responsibility of, of uh, an employer? What's the responsibility of an employee? And uh, how are we going to move forward in terms of finding a new way of working. So for the last, I don't know, 10,000 years, we've had a, uh, a society that works where you, 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 know, you virtually show up for work, you get paid for your time, and your, uh, your uh, employer is responsible for providing you with the equipment to do your job. And, uh, and now it's not going to be the same. Are we going to have hybrid models? Are we going to have everybody completely working from home? And who is responsible for health and who is responsible for equipment and business still hasn't changed. Unfortunately, nobody's going to give you uh, uh, less money or more money for working from home. The, you know, the employer isn't going to earn more because of that. So my conclusion from, or maybe if I can speak, speak for Stephen and Peter, the conclusion from this study is that uh, there are still some serious discussions that need to go on. Uh, I don't think that uh, just sending a workforce home is a wise thing to do. I think it needs to be planned, which it wasn't in this case. Obviously, lockdown, certainly in our office, happened within four days. 
and uh, there wasn't a great deal of planning. We, we wrote a, a plan and we implemented it virtually within days. Uh, and, uh, and going forward, I just think there needs to be a discussion between employees and employers because uh, get it wrong and we'll be paying the price for years to come. And that's it really. Tim, uh, uh, thank you very much indeed for that. That really was a, a, a whistle-stop tour through um, a, a project that took us probably, I don't know, <laughs> yes. to, uh, to uh, pretty four or five weeks to put together and then, and then uh, many weeks to analyze and even more weeks to write it up. And that's a very succinct uh, overview. So much appreciated for that. Thank you. Um, Rob, I don't know if you are um, somewhere um, in, there you go. Uh, Hello. A former colleague of mine, um, it's really good to see you uh, Absolutely. in your new role. You're looking a bit like a DJ there with your, your black You reckon? It's, it's far less interesting, I think. <laughs> and, and Rob has just moved from uh, um, being a writer to a senior writer, so congratulations to you. And uh, so you're kind of sort of well-placed to maybe comment on this because uh, you're sort of you know, you're, you're kind of moving up slowly. Um, you're, you're not at the bottom, you're sort of in the middle now, moving up. What, what comments have you got on the paper? Um, you've, you've seen mm -hmm. it, you haven't seen the final one, but any thoughts or comments that you might like to bring out? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, if, if I was to be proposed the question of, am I surprised by the results? I think the short answer would be no. I think that, um, I'm trying to sort of cast my mind back to May and June because it was, you know, it feels like a completely different era to what it's like now. We've had two, two lockdowns. We've had, you know, all the stress of everything going on. Um, but I think that my answers to the survey fit with the general trend. Um, when we look at sort of the emotional well-being and um, whether people have enjoyed working from home, I think, you know, 75% said that they were enjoying working from home, which I don't think is particularly surprising at all. You know, I think about my experience personally, you know, I live in zone three before I was commuting into central London, 50 minutes every day on a busy train, you know, it's quite a lot of money. You know, I'm thinking about all the wasabis and preps that I haven't had to buy for my lunch. Um, and just the general time at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day where I can you know, I can cook more, you know, I can cook a nicer meal, I can do more exercise. Um, so I think, you know, working from home feels like, you know, I, I think I've enjoyed working from home. Um, it's a nice change from going into the office. Um, and I also think that the way that Medcoms is geared up, I feel like it, it can naturally sort of fit into this working from home model. Uh, I mean, other people will probably disagree with me here, but, you know, we work, we're used to working long hours, but we're used to working for, you know, testing clients. Um, we're used to, you know, doing things, you know, out of the ordinary and, and having to be flexible. And, you know, as Tim said, we didn't have any time to plan for this. You know, it was important that, you know, everybody went into lockdown and got home really quickly. Um, and it was just kind of thrown at us and, and we had to do it. And I think my personal experience, I, I felt like, you know, it, it didn't feel that much different from working in the office. I mean, my office now, um, well, my office was 2000 people. So it was a very busy atmosphere and going from, you know, a central London office to working from home, it was quite a shock really. Um, but I think, you know, it's important that companies sort of appreciate, I mean, it was, we obviously saw that 87% um, of people said there wasn't a health and safety um, check, which was a bit of a shock, really, because I mean, uh, you know, that should have been the first thing on people's priorities. Um, fortunately, you know, I got a chair really quickly. I got a printer, which I thought was really important. Um, I got my VPN set up so we could work confidentially. Um, so, you know, I think that was that, that obviously showed that, that the planning wasn't done and that, that was a bit of a shock. Um, I think the one the, the one thing that really surprised me was the um, lonely and isolated thing. Because um, I think in my experience, that was definitely um, one of the, probably the, the main issue um, of working from home is that, you know, those interactions via Teams or Slack or Skype or whatever you use, um, 
you know, maybe some, maybe a piece of your work's not gone right. You know, a client's not very happy. You get a blunt response through Teams. Um, you know, it can really set you up for a bad day. And it takes a bit of time, I think, to set up that sort of social etiquette within your teams, within your accounts, um, on how you keep in contact with people, um, which I think is, you know, it's one of the challenges that we faced. And it's also worth pointing out that as a writer, isolation isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's been many times where I just want to be left alone to work on something. Uh, and I've had the opportunity now where if, if something's really pressing, if I've got a big project on, I can kind of just turn teams off and, and work in peace, which is good. Um, I think um, it would be interesting to do, I mean, not to give you extra work guys, but I think it would be interesting to see what people's perceptions would be now. Um, I saw some slides pop up earlier I think from Ian, who uh, doesn't seem like um, working from home is a long-term um, solution for him. And I, I would be really interested to see, um, you know, are people fatigued of working from home now? You know, what do people think about this as a model for the, the, the near future? And, you know, it would, hopefully today we can have some, <laughs> hopefully today we can have some uh, frank discussions and, and we can delve into that. Um, but yeah, that's just a little snapshot of, the last nine months for me. <laughs> Rob, thank you very much. Tim, could I ask you to turn your microphone on? Uh, and, and I just wonder if you could just sort of touch on the group who didn't do so well, the sort of quarter to a third who didn't do some work so well. Do, do we have some more thoughts on why this was? Was it just a self-isolation? Was it because they were a more junior crowd? Perhaps one thing we don't know is we don't know what they were like before this. Maybe they were all a bit kind of fed up and down and, and uh, they, you know, it was just waiting for something like this to happen to, to bring out these characteristics. Any thoughts before we go? Uh, well, maybe we are talking about the, the dilemma of the, of the, the artist who uh, works in his garret, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more sympathetic than that. I, I think that, uh, I, you know, I, call me a radical but I believe we're a social animal and I do believe that um, social interaction involves more than um, more than just getting on zoom I I'm a firm believer in working in teams and support and training and uh, I do think that uh, people can be overlooked always the noisiest person and I, I have seen it all if you've seen it, I've seen it worse. I've been in this business for a long time. I'm not in medcoms per se, but I've had god awful clients. Uh, and it's sometimes you want to slope out of your office or away from your desk and find somebody who can just make you feel a little bit better. And and uh, and it may be your boss, but you know when your boss isn't uh, is busy. If his door's shut or he's on the phone, there'll be somebody else within the team. Now. I'm not saying that we are going to move to back to the office. I, I'm, I, I, we've changed our policy at Niche. We're changing what we're doing. We're taking on board this, uh, all, all the findings, and, and we're acting on it. But I don't think that uh, it's something that you just snap your fingers and there's a solution to here. I think there are important things about junior writers. I'm very, very big into bringing juniors on and giving them the experience, the learning, you know, it, it, there needs to be some one-to-one -one interaction there because they, they need to get social skills. I mean, you know, come out of doing a PhD or doing a BSc, can they write an email? Oh yeah, you can teach them to do that, but it, it's nice to do it interaction to, uh, in an interaction setting. I, I just think that uh, let's not just be selfish and say, well, that's good for me. Let's look at what's good for, um, not only for the, uh, say, the, the juniors, but also your boss. Do you know that it takes you a lot more effort to manage people uh, remotely? Because actually the person, the reason you see one of the biggest complaints that people have is that they don't like people disturbing them at their, at their desk. That's like the guy who's, who's dealing with the rudder down at the far end of the ship saying, that captain, he keeps getting in my way. You know what? I'm not going to turn the, the uh, I'm not going to do it because I'll do it when I'm ready. And Titanic hits the iceberg. You know, sometimes there are reasons that we do these things. Uh, but I just say my, my thoughts to looking at this data is it's very important for youngsters to be brought on and to, to uh, have that social interaction for everybody. 
very important to make sure that not just the noisiest people or the people that are always on, on your Skype or instant messenger of one type or another get seen to. And it's, uh, it's, it's very important to be able to see through when people are not as happy as they say that they are. Give them what they need, not what they want is a little bit my, my way of doing that. And I, I've only ever learned to be able to do that by standing next to people with my filters turned off, trying to go, what is it this person really needs? Because that's my job as a boss. You know, I take that very, and it becomes harder. And I don't know about you, but I get at my desk now. I get at my desk at half past seven in the morning. I probably won't leave it till half past seven tonight. So now I'm working 12 hour days at least. Uh, and, and that can be an issue. And, and who's watching, you know, who's watching when you're doing that? Uh, you know, I would hate to think I, I was working last night for a, a client in Germany and uh, uh, I got an email from one of my writers at 10 o'clock at night. And I, I was very, very angry that she was doing that. That wasn't that's not right for me. The client gets the pushback, not the, not the writer, because the writer is going to pay for that in the long term they're going to be tired they oh you, you know all that you i'm not telling anybody anything new so uh, i have my concerns and uh, that's why this study was done um I, you know what i'd love to run it again uh, but uh, there's a lot of data hidden there the original report i wrote stephen will tell you is over forty thousand words long <laughs> that was in my spare time so there's a lot of stuff hidden in there and we're still yeah trying to look at it Jim, thank you very much for that. Um, we have three perspectives from industry. Um, I'm now going to call on Rebecca Douglas um, from Ashfield. And Rebecca, you're going to, uh, your title of your presentation is Training from Home, Evolving the Story. Could I ask you to, to tell us a little bit more, please? Hi, Stephen. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to be here. Interesting discussions already. Yes, so um, as Stephen said, my name is Rebecca Douglas and I am Programme Director for Allegro, which is the Fast Track Training and Development Programme for Ashfield Healthcare Communications. And I've been brought here today to talk about our experience of running a training programme from home. So just uh, a little bit of background. Oh, it's a bit background noise. I don't know if someone's got their, got their mic on. So in early 2020, we had um, committed to take on um, 13 associate medical writers. And associate medical writers are entry level, our training writers. Um, and to train them by our 12 month Allegro programme. So these guys have already been through interview. We've already committed to, to bringing them on board. And they were due to start on the 20th of April. And then, um, as we all know, on the 16th of March, national lockdown happened for us in the UK. And we had lots of discussions about how we were going to handle it. Um, but we decided that we would adapt the programme and we would train our associate medical writers virtually. So for people who don't know about how Allegro works and about the mechanics of it, it's set up like this. So as I said, originally it's a 12 month fast track program. So it's really important that our writers get an awful lot out of the 12 months because at the end of the 12 months, what we aim to do for the majority of them is to promote them to medical writers. Um, so it's important that they can learn all the key competencies during that initial 12 months. There's no time to waste. So months one to two are core skills training. So this is um, a focused training phase. Um, it's not client facing. And previously we delivered that in our Macclesfield office um, and it was face-to-face -face training. And it's a mixture of classroom style training and um, the AMW's practice skills like writing manuscripts, writing abstracts, learning how to write the digital, the lay audiences. So lots and lots of um, practice and one-to-one -one feedback, and also quite a lot of teamwork. Um, at the end of those uh, two months, our associates go out into rotation A, 
and rotationary loss for five months. They're integrated into the team and they do that in one of our UK offices and they can choose which one. Um, rotation B, again, they're still under the Allegro umbrella, so they're still receiving a lot of training and mentoring. Um, but by this time, they're, they're more experienced. And rotation B is with a different client, normally in a different business unit. And it's normally a different type of writing. And the aim of that is so that our medical writers um, get a really wide exposure to business and to networking. So you can see that previously there were lots and lots of face-to-face um, -face interactions and, and all of this had to be converted to an online program. So we had about a month from making the decision to go ahead with, with the 12 month training program um, to our associate medical writers, intake eight is our eighth intake, um, actually starting with us at the end of April. So we spent a lot of time initially looking at different platforms and different functionalities. And, and it seems really crazy now, isn't it? Um, which we're all so familiar with Zoom and with breakout rooms and whiteboards and polls. But back in April, all of that was a bit alien to us, if I'm honest. And so we spent time playing around with um, software. Um, and then we looked at the two month intensive training course and we looked at it as a whole and we adapted it. So we made all of the sessions shorter, we took some stuff out, we moved some stuff around, we broke it down into smaller chunks. We made a commitment that we wouldn't have sessions of more than 15 to 20 minutes without having breakouts, whiteboards, interaction. Um, when we were in the classroom, we were traditionally um, training about 15 people at a time. The intakes tend to be around 15, sometimes a couple less, sometimes a couple more. And we would tend to train them all together in one room. What we did when we went to a virtual setting is we broke it down and we ran three identical sessions in parallel. So we have three trainers training at the same time in much smaller groups. Um, we brought in some sessions with people outside of the core Allegro team, so outside of those three core trainers. We already had some of that in before when we were in the classroom setting and um, face to face, but we did it in a slightly different way to the, the virtual setting. We introduced social sessions into the programme, so we were very, very conscious of the fact that teamwork is absolutely key to everything we do in MedComs. And we wanted our associate medical writers to still form a team and to still feel part of the team. And so we introduced set sessions that were socials and we said, this isn't just advisable, this is compulsory. <laughs> Forced fun, we called it. Um, we also increased the frequency of general touch points with the trainers. So we had an awful lot of one-to-ones. We did an awful lot of checking in with people. And I think this goes back to what Tim was saying, actually, that it isn't an easy ride to manage people remotely. Actually, in many ways, you have to work a lot harder at it because you have to put in more touch points. You have to work harder at working out how people are doing. And so we structured the program in such a way that those touch points were kind of compulsory all the way through. So we were speaking one-on-one -on -one with people very frequently. So we ran the program once and we got some good feedback. We asked lots of questions and um, I'll show you some of those results later on. Um, but then we decided we were going to go ahead and run it again. Um, and so we evaluated, I'm not going to talk about remote recruitment because I know that that's been touched upon later on by Susie, um, but we, we recruited remotely again. And while, whilst we were waiting for that second intake to come in, we looked at the whole programme again. What had we done virtually that worked really well? And what did we need to change in light of what we'd learned first time round? So we didn't need to spend any more time working on functionality in Zoom. We were all very familiar by, with it by that point. 
we kept the shorter sessions because we thought it was really important in a virtual setting that those sessions were short and punchy. Um, we kept all of the breakout work. We have had brilliant feedback on our breakout sessions, um, but we kept kind of that rule, that informal rule that we wouldn't go more than 15 to 20 minutes without interactivity. I would say we actually go a lot less in, in, in reality. Um, we mixed up the group, so the majority of time we still train three parallel groups, but we mixed it up a bit, so we do have sessions now that are also in, in the slightly bigger group, in the 15, um, and the reason for that was just to keep mixing up the dynamics so it's not the same all the time. Um, we kept social sessions in but we made them shorter and more frequent. So in the first intake, we did an hour's social every Friday. Um, in the, the second time round, we made those blocks shorter. So we did some nine o'clock half hour sessions. Um, we did some end of the day sessions and, and we did some of those sessions without the trainers. So we gave people a rough um, uh, topic to talk about. How did you find the manuscript task, for example? And um, we removed ourselves from some of them and then we kept in some of the longer quizzes and things like that on a Friday and we, we made sure we attended those. Um, we kept the, the increased frequency of general touch points with the trainers. I think that's really, really important. We introduced some more structured introductions to roles and of people within the business. So what we realised first time round is that we didn't have those networking lunches that we normally have when people are in the office. And those kind of um, chance introductions that people make at the coffee machine or in the kitchen, there isn't the opportunity to do that online. And so we introduced some things where we brought different people in from around the business and let just let people chat to them. And, and this last one's an, an interesting point and it wasn't really planned we have been doing more outreach work with universities and so on. And so we, we had some training tops with our Allegro logos on. Um, and all of the trainers decided that we would wear them to do training. And what we noticed, and it wasn't planned, as I said, it was just a bit of something that we observed, was that when we were dressed for work, when we had our training tops on, second time round, actually, all of the ANWs turned up in the morning in work clothes. They were ready to learn and they were ready to work. Um, and that's interesting because I think for me, it's a personal observation, but I think that you are happier working from home when you're considering that you're working in a work environment and you're dressed for it and feel better. So, at the end of um, both of the intakes, we asked people lots of questions. We, we did an, it was completely anonymized, so we don't know who, who responded what. Um, but we asked lots and lots of questions. I've just got a few of the results here. So we asked people how they enjoyed the eight week um, core skills training. And um, most of our AMWs um, said that they really enjoyed it or they enjoyed it. And we had one person in both intakes that somewhat enjoyed it. So that was a quite positive result. We asked them about how they found the Zoom delivery of training because we were very conscious that people spend a lot of time at their screens. And again, the vast majority of our AMWs rated it a 10 out of 10. Um, we worked very hard on it, but we didn't know how it was going to go back in March. We asked people um, how strongly they agreed with the sentence, I felt part of the team during training, and we asked them to mark it out of 10. And, you know, similar to, I think, um, the findings of, of the earlier survey that was discussed, most people felt very much part of the team. We worked really hard at it. It wasn't an easy thing to do. And we did have time to plan, which is different to um, people that got sent home overnight and had to adapt. Um, but most people did actually feel part of a team, but there were some people that struggled with that. Obviously, we don't have the comparison of how those people would have got on in the office. Um, but, but there were a couple of people that did struggle with it and would have preferred to have been in an office. 
Um, we asked people whether they felt that the remote learning aspect of the course was beneficial, detrimental, or made no difference to their learning and development. And what we found was that a majority of people found it either beneficial or made no difference. Some people found it detrimental. And again, we don't have the comparison for this, these groups had they been in the office, but it is interesting. So moving on from the um, core skills training, which is the really intensive training phase, um, our Allegro AMWs then go, <coughs> excuse me, go into um, rotation. And what we found, and these are just observations, was that the people that did best were the ones who went into agencies where the teams worked really hard on those virtual introductions. So those people settled much quicker. Um, it was really, really important that there were regular team catch-ups, both social and work-related. That really helped people feel part of the team and settle quickly. It was important for us as managers to make sure that even though we were out of core skills training, we were really regularly catching up with people and we were checking in on them pastorally to make sure that everything was okay, there was nothing that we could help with, that they were getting everything that they needed from their rotations. In between the first and the second virtual rotation A, uh, we introduced an advisor or buddy system so that there was that additional person checking in on people. Um, so I suppose somewhat differently to if you're in a, a regular office job, um, our AMWs do have a lot of people that are kind of invested in their development. Um, a couple of just additional thoughts. It's really, we found it really important that we set a good impression. Um, it's really important that we're on time for meetings or we're early to meetings because that stops everybody else thinking it's okay to log in five minutes late. Keeping those social etiquette um, things alive is important. So taking time to say good morning to people ask how people's evenings were. You know, those things that you do in the office are really important for a team dynamic. Prioritizing line management responsibilities, so making sure that those um, touch points in the week are prioritized, they're not delayed. Um, when we're all busy, dressing appropriately, so getting up in the morning and getting dressed, it makes you feel so much better. We, we find that keeping cameras on is really key. Um, actually for good training because you can see people in, in, in a small group you can see instantly uh, what people are doing how engaged they are you can see from the expressions on their faces because you get used to them and when cameras are off you miss a lot of that um, maintaining energy levels as a trainer was really important for me and for our trainees so um we employ different techniques for different sessions. But for example, if I'm de delivering quite a long training session, I always stand to present like I would do if I was in the office because that keeps my energy levels up. Um, we encourage all of our AMWs to have their monitors raised so that they're looking up and they're not stooped over and they're not tired from stooping over. Um, IT is really important. So good internet connections, um, are really, really encouraged and we check with our AMWs before um, they start if they have got good internet connections. Um, I think it's really important that people use monitors, not laptops. Um, and where possible, we encourage, and it's not always possible, but we encourage people to have a working environment that is de a dedicated space. So again, this isn't a scientific um, summary, but this is my summary, having trained um, in a virtual setting twice now. Um, so there's pros and cons to working from home. We didn't have a choice in this instance, um, but this would be my summary of pros and cons. So our pros are that we haven't had to bring 30, well, 28 people to Macclesfield for training. We can be really, really flexible in terms of breakout groups. So I always call it um, being like Harry Potter and you know you split people into breakout groups and it's like they go down a chimney and they come up in a different room. So um, that flexibility in terms of breakout rooms and not having to 
physically send people out into different parts of the building actually means that the training flows really well because you don't have that like relocation, physical relocation time. Same with whiteboards, you're not, you're not dragging a whiteboard over, waiting for your pen to work, you know, flipping paper that falls off walls and so on and so forth. Um, so there's lots of opportunities for thinking from a different perspective and creativity in terms of training. We don't have any transport issues. Um, I think that was something Rob mentioned before. We've had to think of inventive ways of socialising. Um, so we've had to invest in how we do that um, and think of it outside the box. And we've tried to do that. Um, and, and we've brought those sessions in in a formal way, really. Work-life balance can be a pro and a con. So, you know, our AMWs, we can try and encourage them to go out and get some fresh air at lunchtime, and exercise, their evening can start earlier. There are cons as well. So there's reduced opportunity for networking by chance. Um, you know, those people that you get to know just because you pass them in the corridor at the same time every day, the people that you went to reception with at the same time and you say hello to, all those networking opportunities that just happen in an office don't happen. There's a reduction in learning by um, absorption. And I think Tim, I think that's what Tim was alluding to. So, you know, when you're sitting next to someone and you say, well, that's quite cool what you've done with that PowerPoint. How have you done that? They don't see that. So th th I think there is definitely a, a con from our perspective there. There are obviously social implications of isolation for some people, and that's been particularly acute for lots of people this year. The work-life balance can be a con as well. So there's less separation between work and home, which I know Rob was talking about. And we need to work harder at creating that team spirit. Um, it, it isn't easy to keep up the momentum. I think you kind of get into the habit of it after a while, but you have got to constantly work at it. You know, there's not that joker in the office um, that's keeping everyone's spirits up. So as a management level, we have to work harder at that. Um, and, and that's kind of my summary and our findings from the Allegro team. Uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, uh, gosh, interesting times. Um, uh, happening at Ashfield, uh, and uh, interesting how you try to cope with everything. I love the t-shirts. Um, time's running on. I'm not quite sure we're going to have any uh, time questions. Uh, maybe a little bit later on. But um, uh, so may I ask um, Susie Marriott to, to now um, present to us. S Susie is at uh, Prime Global, uh, and she is going to be talking about recruiting and joining remotely. Uh, Susie, are you there? I am indeed, uh, and actually I'm also joined by my colleague May. Um, so to kick us off, um, I'm Susie Marriott. I joined Prime Global actually at the end of March 2020, so uh, in the first week of the first lockdown. Uh, but I've since recruited a new member to my team, so today I'll be sharing my experiences as a hiring manager. Um, so I'm May, I joined the company in October, um, so I actually interviewed remotely and I joined remotely, so I'll be going through my experience really as a new new joiner um, and being onboarded completely remotely. So to set the scene a little bit, um, even before the pandemic, Prime Global was already collaborating across the US and the UK offices and with some existing fully remote employees. Our uh, internal structure is such that teams aren't actually um, restricted to a particular location. And as part of the people first approach, there's a flexible working policy that also includes working from home. Um, but as I think everybody found this year, the arrival of the pandemic and the need to keep people safe meant we all moved to working from home. And we really had to take collaborating virtually to the next level. That also included our recruitment and onboarding processes. And um, so the next couple of slides, we're breaking those down a little bit further and sharing our experiences of the main stages of applying, interviewing, and actually joining or onboarding. So 
So um, Prime Global has continued to grow and recruit people around the world. Um, we've recruited people in all different levels, different types of roles, um, and we've managed to do this all remotely. We've had the opportunity to improve our virtual interviewing processes as well. Um, one of the things that we've taken away and one of the things that we've learned is making sure that we've got the right recruitment um, system and platform in place so it's easy for um, applicants to apply, to upload their CV. Um, from my own experience, I remember I saw the advert on LinkedIn, which then took me straight onto Prime's recruitment platform where I applied. Um, I uploaded my CV and it was quite a, a straightforward process. And from the hiring manager's perspective, um, it, whatever that system or the software you're using, it should be really easy for everyone involved in all aspects of the hire to be able to access and review candidate CVs, to be able to leave comments and feedback on candidates, and also uh, to request interviews to be set up and just keep that process moving. So from my experience, I guess as a as a candidate, um, I applied and then I received an email from the recruitment team who then set up a video interview. Um, they sent me their Microsoft Teams link. So it was really well organized. Um, the next few slides, we're just going to go into a little bit about the pros and cons of video interviewing. Um, so yeah, just to start off, I guess, with pros and cons, um, for me to schedule the interview that I had, I was actually able to do it around my previous role. Um, so it was quite good. I didn't need to book annual leave or time off. I could kind of manage it around my previous, um, my previous job. Um, it also didn't take up as much time as a face-to-face -face interview would because I didn't have to travel into the office or into London. So I was able to do that all remotely. I think it's sometimes easier as well to organise diaries from the interviewers as well, particularly if they're not normally based in the same office or if they're travelling. Um, and the other thing we found is actually that interviewing everyone virtually creates a really consistent approach for both employees who'd normally be based in an office and those who'd normally be based remote as well. Um, also, just to add on that, I guess to touch on one of the disadvantages that I felt was um, not actually seeing the office, not seeing where the location was, um, and just not getting a feel for the for the office. Um, another disadvantage was I think it's difficult to build that eye contact, that um, rapport when it comes to a video interview and if there's any technical issues like we experienced today. Um, but yeah, that was the difficult part, how, how to sort of build that initial rapport, eye contact. Um, so that was, a, I guess, a disadvantage. That's so true. I always end up looking at the video feed on the screen instead of directly at the camera. Um, so you don't get that that sort of engagement with the other person and it's sometimes difficult to tell body language as well if you're only seeing a head and shoulder shot. Um, obviously we've we've experienced some technical, technical differences, difficulties today um, but a, another example is that one interview I did was um, we had a really poor internet connection the, vi the video feed kept freezing and um, even when we turned the cameras off to see if it would help there was still like big gaps and at one point I wasn't sure if the candidate was just pausing before answering my question or if the caller just completely dropped. So it made it a lot more difficult to keep the conversation flowing and getting that sort of natural feel between interviewee and interviewer. Uh, however in that case I'm really pleased to say that she was an amazing candidate and we didn't have technical issues in her second interview. <laughs> On the next slide I think we'll just have a little look at the joining and onboarding. Oh joining and onboarding. <clears throat> okay, so joining and onboarding at Prime. So um, from my perspective, I found the process really well organized. Um, the IT team do a great job in getting equipment over. Um, so before I joined, I got an email to say that my IT, IT equipment is on its way. Um, 
I received a welcome pack. I think all these little things actually make a big difference in making a new joiner feel welcome uh, and valued right from the offset. Um, also, during my first week and my first couple of um, uh, weeks, um, HR and the training team actually set up inductions in my diary. So it was all well organized. Um, and I got the opportunity to meet lots of different people in the business right from the go. Um, and again, also just to touch on feeling disconnected. So I personally haven't felt disconnected, um, even though I joined remotely. Um, there's a strong sense of teamwork and collaboration. And one of our company values is partnership. And I definitely think that is reflected in um, how we do things from a new joiner and um, onboarding point of view. Um, so I've, yeah, I've definitely felt welcomed right from the offset. That was my experience as well. And I think particularly this year, there's a, there's a sort of recognition amongst existing employees that it is uh, an unusual situation uh, and everyone's making even more of an effort to reach out to people, to be available to people so that um, you, can, you really don't feel like you're isolated in a bubble of one in your own house. Um, and that, that sort of culture that people first and helping each other is something that really does go beyond just physical spaces and is about the, the team and the colleagues who you value around you. Um, just to add on what Susie said, so another thing that helped me as, as a new joiner was getting stuck into meaningful work right from the go um, and having good um, feedback from my line manager really sort of helped me. Um, along with just the sort of full onboarding process and the ability to meet key people from the leadership team um, really helped me understand um, the business. Um, also at Prime, we have um, internal initiatives like quizzes and um, different types of competitions. And that really helps kind of, that really helps to get to know different people. I've also found that our company updates are a really useful way to learn about what's happening in teams beyond the people I interact with in my day-to-day -day role. Um, and as a line manager, I think both, both uh, you know, Tim and, and Rebecca have touched on this a little bit, but really taking the time to build that relationship with the team, understanding what's important to people professionally and personally, and how you can help them be successful in that. Um, a part of that is, is creating space for conversations to develop naturally, the same way that you would if you were all sharing an office together. Um, I appreciate that's been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, but we hope that's uh, given you a little taste of our experience at Prime Global. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Susie, um, May, I, I love your double act, though you'd obviously rehearsed this, the way you went back and forth with the slides, and I, I thank you so much for keeping to time. Um, well done. I'm now going to call, uh, uh, call on uh, Karina. Uh, Karina is from, uh, from Lucid, um, and uh, she is going to tell us a little bit from, from an HR perspective. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit about employee well-being in the time of a global pandemic. Um, Karina, I think it's fair to say that you have a particular interest in staff welfare, uh, and this whole topic is quite close to your heart. So um, I know from our conversations in preparation for this event, that you, uh, uh, you know, this is something that uh, uh, you, you would like to for, forward and advance and contribute to. So over to you, Karina. Absolutely. Thank you for that introduction, Stephen. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of today's event. Um, um, just a, such an amazing opportunity to learn, discuss things. Oh, you know, these matters are so important, given what has happened this year. So what I wanted to do today is to share some of um, Lucy's experiences and in particular some of the solutions that um, we have implemented to address some of the dilemmas, questions that we've already been uh, raising so many times uh, in the last hour or so. Um, and all of this will be, like Stephen said, from a perspective of a human, uh, sorry, human resources professional. Um, very much tying into that entire conversation about well-being, because if we want to talk about better homeworking, effective homeworking, 
we do have to consider this broader picture, which is um, just well-being um, of the human being uh, in general. Um, so what I'm going to do, so this is yet another whistle-stop tour um, of the topics that you can hopefully see the summary of the agenda on this slide. Um, any questions, discussion? I, of course, I'm very open to answer questions and discuss afterwards um, what, yeah, what I'm presenting, what I'm, what I'm saying to you today. So to start with, in terms of that broader context, um, employee wellness, including supporting a flexible working culture uh, and home working in particular, has actually been um, a strategic focus of our business plan long before COVID struck. Um, the, pan the pandemic has basically uh, um, elevated that focus uh, and enabled us to kind of really, uh, well, to really prioritize uh, those ambitions. So this year we have formally um, launched a dedicated well-being brand, which we have called Lucid Being, um, which is um, our formal commitment, if you like, um, to building a truly well-being focused culture um, under which a wide variety um, of our wellness inspired policies, practices and activities are, um, are organized. And just like we go about any other people plus initiatives that we roll out that we look into uh, to make sure what we implement is actually effective, employee voice is um, very central to shaping lucid beings agenda. And what this little diagram here uh, on this slide summarizes um, is basically that ongoing cycle of feedback um, and its impact on our people strategy. So that includes uh, our wellness uh, strategy as well. Uh, importantly, um, as you can see that, well, a key element of this cycle um, is having the input of our uh, wonderful team of well-being champions from across the business, effectively businesses of employee representatives who are passionate about well-being and who are uh, passionate about driving those wellness activities and uh, wellness agenda um, in general. Uh, so other key channels of feedback that we have um, implemented that are worth mentioning um, are wellness wellometer, which is effectively um, a team-based tool of opening up those uh, wellness conversations and seeking solutions uh, in a teamwork setting. Um, or a second key tool, which offers a kind of, um, well, a more personalized uh, um, look, well, it's a personalized tool of um, enabling wellness conversations in a one-to-one -one setting between an employee and a line manager is lucid disk. So this is just a couple of measures, um, channels of feedback that we have um, implemented this year to, to drive these conversations. Okay, and very quickly, um, so this is um, a quick, very brief summary of um, some of the lucid being activity that we have seen this year. Uh, I'm saying brief because we can, we actually have done much more than this. And I have to say, again, the pandemic has really elevated that focus on the well-being and development of our um, uh, agenda and program, uh, and program under lucid being um, umbrella. Okay, so having had a look at that context, so how does all of it um, translated into creating that great home working experience uh, for our employees this year, or that better home working experience, um, if you like. Um, so here's a um, glimpse into, into um, the Lucid experience. So the first very practical challenge uh, we have faced, which has been mentioned more than once already during uh, uh, well, today, um, has been scaling up um, the already existing agile working policy that we have um, implemented a couple of years back formally. Um, so at Lucid, again, we've already had an established flexible working culture um, with a lot of home-based staff um, around, well, dotted around the UK. Um, 
And as you might know, in 2019, to kind of further, sorry, further drive this, uh, we've opened a hot desk slash collaboration focused Middlesex House um, office headquarters in Fitzroya, London. This year, the challenge was though, um, that, well, basically, um, what was choice for many to work from home and collaborate from office as and when needed has become a necessity uh, literally overnight for all staff. So when that disaster struck in March, effective remote tech support, including health and safety, uh, became one of our number one prior, prior, sorry, priorities. Uh, so with short-term prioritization of essential hardware, um, software, and workstation needs being um, addressed first and foremost. Um, and because we foresee this new way of working is largely here to stay, our long-term vision is actually to transform these um, traditionally office-based resources, resources and processes into a sustainable um, home-based infrastructure or that hybrid model that, you know, that term has come up a couple of times um, during today's um, presentations uh, all as well. And um, we actually are delighted as well to have just, just hired our first in-house IT director who will be very keen to, to driving this um, agenda. So the second big ticket item uh, on that transformation journey we have gone through um, has been how our practices around work-life balance have evolved for us this year. So overwhelmingly, and I think that is actually, uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad this is also reflected in Tim's, um, Tim's paper. Um, overwhelmingly, our employees really enjoyed working from home, uh, being able to be more in control of their time, uh, not having to commute, um, being able to essentially flex their hours based completely on their own work calendars um, combined with home needs and prominently this year, um, homes, well, having to homeschool or due to childcare needs. Um, and it's important to say that to, um, to make this work, what really uh, mattered to us and what we tried to foster was that mutual trust um, um, between employees and the employer to, to, again, to really make this work. And it's been largely overwhelmingly a success, like I have said. So interestingly, uh, and that's something Tim mentioned as well, since the boundaries between home and work life can often get blurry if you work from home every day, and especially if you don't have much experience at doing it, um, we, um, as a result, we've decided to provide our workforce with a couple of um, uh, educational webinars on effective home working back in April um, through a wellbeing and resilience solutions company uh, called Feel Good Co. Uh, so moving on to the next item, which is homeschooling. Uh, just a little bit about that. So it, this has in fact become a key pressure point um, for many to actually be able to maintain this work balance we talk about. The stresses of homeschooling have, um, I guess, led us to set up our first group-wide, um, fully employee-led, family-friendly um, online community called Lucid, uh, Lucid Littlelands, um, which has been uh, basically a tremendous success. Um, it helped us to foster this connection, mutual support between parents, um, and has in fact sparked a lot of useful conversations about um, our family friendly offer altogether and what we can do in the future uh, to make that family friendly experience of Lucid even better. So moving on to a very important aspect um, of working from home and the pandemic in general, which is mental health. Um, a significant and unique challenge that we faced this year. And I think it's very important to, to, uh, to remember that when we talk about better home working, because I think that piece of research Tim has done has definitely been affected by the fact that we are in a pandemic setting as opposed to a um, so-called normal setting when people work from home but have access to, uh, um, to, to, to uh, the normal ways of functioning in the world. So social isolation. 
uh, is definitely a very unique aspect of what everyone has gone through this year. Uh, and it has definitely has been, uh, it has been exacerbated uh, by the fact that we are stuck at home all the time. We don't even have access to um, our colleagues in, in, a, in a normal way. <clears throat> so at Lucid, we've been very passionate about um, tackling these feelings of loneliness and isolation. So we have had um, quite a few initiatives rolled out in this space. So to start with, uh, Positivity um, is an initiative that we've rolled out very early on in, during the pandemic um, to really encourage employees to um, reach out to each other for those quick chats for non-work related reasons um, over Zoom or phone, um, effectively to uh, kind of to replicate those water cooler moments that uh, they just didn't get any exposure to uh, this year in, in, in offices. Um, during the summertime, so we have implemented a number of um, uh, so-called summer initiatives, but a key one within this context has been Pivot for Six. Uh, so when uh, lockdown restrictions were loosened up a little, we encouraged our teams to meet uh, in socially distanced safe settings um, for picnics, which were fully paid by Lucid, um, just to, again, encourage a little, bit of, of, a little bit more of that interaction we all very much crave this year. And this year, we have also, the first time uh, ever, we have trained a, mental health, a team of mental health first aiders, including myself, across the business, so pretty much every single team within our business has an access to um, mental health support through someone who is fully accredited and knows how to you know, uh, provide that first aid uh, as and when needed. And finally, something that has been mega popular in the business as well, um, we talk about social isolation. However, on the flip side, some of our employees were actually complaining about too many Zoom meetings, too much pressure to do with being on video calls all the time, not having a time you know, to, uh, to really get that lunch or just, just get that break during the day in between meetings. So to kind of um, help people, to, to enable them to work without just Zoom um, video call interactions and interruptions, we have set up um, an, initiative, an initiative called Free Up Fridays, which in essence enables people um, once in a while um, to have um, a green light from the company, uh, not to have to, well, basically not to uh, feel like they need to participate in, in, in any internal meetings or calls or, um, um, or interactions for one afternoon uh, so that they could just get stuck in, in their, whether it's their emails or a project that you've been trying to get through without uh, having to be, again, in meetings all the time. <clears throat> so culture. So if you look at the bottom of the slide uh, in the middle, um, how did we maintain our culture? So this is a very important aspect of um, how to make your, um, how to, you know, keep on people uh, feeling connected to your values, to the mission and vision and uh, just your culture all together. Uh, they're working from home and they are physically uh, kind of, well, away from their fellow employees and those connections are not naturally um, maintained. It's much harder to maintain them in remote settings. So we have, as a result of what's happened this year, we have completely revamped, if you like, how we go about communications, how we go about engagement. Um, I mean, there's so many things that we have done, but to name a few examples of what we have uh, actually done, we have established regular group team uh, briefings, fully virtual uh, group team briefings. We have also appointed an engagement, um, uh, employee engagement manager to help us lead on, lead on those initiatives now um, and in the future. And finally, oh, sorry, a little bit too quick. Um, I always like to say finally that, um, well, um, we, we don't know what we don't know. We are in such unprecedented circumstances. It is very important uh, to listen to what your staff 
uh, has to say. So I'm going back to what I've said about employee voice, especially because you've never been in this situation before. So it is important to really make sure that anything that you uh, implement and shape within your organization, whether it's now during lockdown, or whether uh, that's going to be in the future, uh, you have to look to your staff and you know, set up channels via which they feel comfortable to feed back to you um, so that you can uh, use that to, to, again, to shape your agenda um, of the future. And to wrap it all up, I'm very conscious of time, uh, just a few reflections as to what I see um, as the future coming out of this uh, very unprecedented year of, um, of changes across society and workplaces. So, and that's something I said at the very beginning. Um, I think when you talk about better homeworking, you have to talk about it in the context of well-being altogether. And what you need to do is to, um, you know, this this year is actually a great opportunity to um, to set up those fundamentals around a long-term sustainable um, employee vision, um, well-being vision, uh, feeding into a, actually all the people practices uh, because they are ve all very much interlinked. Um, secondly, um, the homeworking evolution or revolution, however you want to refer to it, uh, we've got to um, uh, think about it as an extension of what has been happening already. But the pandemic has sped up uh, the process of homeworking becoming more prevalent, well, more of, um, um, important, in, not just in metacoms, but in industries um, across the board, well, various industries. Um, so I think what the pandemic has shown, I think in the, con well, certainly in the context of what we have achieved at Lucid, what we have seen at Lucid, is that working remotely um, can work. It is mission possible. And in fact, I think it will be very um, central to remaining competitive um, in, our, um, in our industry. Um, thirdly, uh, I think you know the pandemic is an is an amazing opportunity to look at our talent pools. We have a notoriously, as we know, um, um, small talent pool um, when it comes you know, when it comes to um, talent attraction and talent retention for us HR professionals. This is always a bit of a dilemma and how to manage this talent pool uh, best so that we. You know, the best talent stays with us and the best talent wants to join us. So if we think about remote working, I think the pandemic has opened up some questions around how about hiring uh, talent in other countries? If people work remotely effectively, it doesn't matter where they're based. Can we hire more flexibly? Can we hire in other time zones? Um, would that work? And if so, uh, isn't that an amazing opportunity to widen up uh, this talent pool? Um, and finally, You've got to think about the practical stuff. So the um, all the admin that goes in the background. So we've had a lot of questions around uh, what does the need, what does the need my contract? I actually like working remotely. I want to work from home uh, more regularly. Um, so to tackle these um, issues and questions, uh, we've got to think about the work location, in particular, and working hours, clauses, and contracts. So something we've looked at at Lucid um, was to kind of convert that work location clause to basically say what the employee's designated office location is, as opposed to the permanent work office, if that makes sense, to kind of create um, that expectation that the, of the office will become kind of this collaboration space as opposed to space where you have to be every day. Um, and flexible working hours is something that we have actually done much earlier, and that was prior to the pandemic kicking off. Um, um, our employees are contracted to a set amount of working hours, but it actually doesn't really uh, matter to us as much as to when they will uh, do those hours. There are no setting start times, uh, set start times and end times to, to anyone's day. It's about just making sure that you do the work that you're expected to do. It doesn't matter to us as much when you're going to do it. Um, and finally, that's something that is very important as well. Um, and that's been 
a massive challenge. I'm not going to lie, at the beginning of the pandemic, there are questions around how do you scale up um, that remote tech support if you were um, an organization which um, work, well, expected people to work from the office more often than from home. Obviously that infrastructure needs to be looked at and how do you set up an infrastructure where there is more focus on working from home and you know, supporting people with regards to, when it's, um, with regards to that, um, IT equipment of software or chairs, you name it, uh, health and safety and the like. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for um, um, signing in and, and listening to what we wanted to share. And I look forward to, to uh, questions and discussions later on. Karina, thank you very much. Gosh, lots of information in there. Uh, very grateful for your clear presentation. Thank you so much for that. Uh, a, a little bit uh, over time now. Um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Christina. Christina is a, a busy GP in West London in her own practice. Uh, we're, we're shifting the presentation a little bit now because uh, Christina is going to look at uh, a little bit about, uh, I think you're going to present uh, some data at the start, Christina, and yep. then I think you're going to talk a little bit about some of the health aspects um, uh, because I think you, you're seeing some patients are coming into your practice now who are clearly struggling at the moment. So. Uh, Christina, thank you for joining us, uh, and it's over to you. Yeah, I named it the title Working From Home, uh, Toll on Mental Health, because that's what we see from the medical side. And I just want to uh, show um, one study. I know you did the study with the Medcom community, but I think it probably doesn't work for everybody well, as probably the Medcom community works from home much more than other uh, work uh, people from other work related um, groups and the Nuffield study this was a survey from June basically after the first uh, lockdown and they felt that 80 percent of Brits feel that working from home has a negative impact on their mental health and I thought that was quite a big chunk of people they felt it was 36 had unable to take a break or stay away from their computer. There was much higher level of anxiety, stress, loneliness. With the pandemic, a lot of financial problems because uh, especially freelance people uh, perhaps don't have the chance to have uh, um, get any jobs. And uh, what Tim mentioned a little bit is difficult and 30% find it difficult to separate their home from their work life and 27% found it very difficult to switch off. And 34 felt that it had a big strain on their relationship with their partners and children. And the Office of National Statistics actually revealed that 7.4 uh, 7 million of us have reported feeling lonely, especially the uh, people who do homeschooling. Where I thought, you know, homeschooling, you have these children there, you don't actually feel isolated but the studies shows different. Those who regularly work from home, and I think that's probably the medcom community, have sort of established routines and boundaries and find it much easier to have um, um, uh, home working than other people who are not used to it. What are the tips from the medical side? Um, create and divide your workday. So like Rebecca said, get dressed nicely, make an effort and have the room environment right, have the temperature right, light. They said, if your desk is in the dark, put it uh, near the window. Also take regular breaks for lunch, going for a walk, simple stretching exercise, which is obviously the rate of back pains. I have seen much more musculoskeletal problems because the chair is not right. We just work along in a really bad posture. So it is actually worthwhile looking at all these things. And keep the camera switched off. Um, like you said, Friday afternoons, people don't have to join it because it can be quite stressful to be on the Zoom all the time, especially if you are a non-technical person like I am. And use relaxation training like meditation, yoga to switch off. Um, and the focus should also be on getting a good night's sleep. So decide to forget about work, plan your bedtime, don't use your bedroom as your study, really separate it, have a peaceful area in, in your house. 
um, focus on positives. So if you are annoyed, you know, obviously your colleague gave you this and that to work, try to actually compartmentalize it and say, actually, I come to it later. Tips to ameliorate decision fatigue. This was actually um, a report in the Royal GP Journal because we do a lot of things now remotely with a video consultation or telephone consultation. And what they actually saw that GPs got really tired because we have to decide every 10 minutes what we are actually doing. So, uh, and I think this might work for your community as well. It's take a uh, delegate task if you can, use guidance, that's important for us that we say actually the nice guidance says this and this and it helps us to make decisions. I find it very important to come back to things later. And obviously with homework, you can actually park it at the side and say, I really do this later. And recognize what tasks can wait. Like what Tim says, there's so many 40 emails, you know, so many deadlines. But is it really a deadline or are we creating ourselves a deadline? And break from your computer, I think that's, and have uh, manageable chunks. So if you look at it and have 40 emails, just have time when you look at your emails and don't get stressed about it. Uh, plan to reduce worries. I think for the medcom community would be great to have what we have like a doctor's mess where you actually once a month just chat and share your problems. Ask for help. If you, you are overwhelmed and say, actually, I cannot cope with this. I'm sure you know other medcom people who feel the same because you are not alone. I think a lot of people feel like, oh, I'm alone, I have to deal with this. Actually, it's, it's not the case. A lot of people are in your situation. We have at the Royal College um, used a lot of online yoga. And there's quite nice sort of exercises at the desk, which you can do like three times a day just to stretch out. And I think it's important as well to set boundaries. So if people say, oh, I need it today, you know, look, is it realistic you're doing it today or can it really wait? Because in a way, nothing is really urgent. And uh, Jim wanted me to um, brush up a little bit on, on anxiety. We have seen much more mental health in general practice. And what are the sort of signs, symptoms is overthinking, you ruminate, you have headaches, you have difficulty sleeping, even nausea, dizziness can be symptoms of anxiety. Um, how can I reduce it? I think uh, important is to have a good network, family, friends, um, uh, try mindfulness. Mindfulness is actually to look around you, you know, reflect on yourself and the uh, community around you. I find as well the NHS website is uh, a very good tool. They have sort of mindfulness uh, toolkits or anxiety toolkits where you can actually look in and say, actually, I'm, am I anxious or not? Mm, and there are a lot of now sort of online counseling, talking therapies. And um, if you feel you, know, you need obviously to, to see a GP, then obviously contact your GP. Or we can refer for counseling. And sometimes we embark in medication which now the first line is uh, actually antidepressants, which work very well for anxiety. Might be just a short-term interim, but it is really important to ask for help. And I'm coming to the end. So I cannot teach anyone anything. I can only make them think. And this is the role of a doctor that you make people think. I, I never have the solution and I, as you probably know, uh, a lot of GPs have uh, contacted the mental health support team much more, and I'm sure in every job it is the same. And I think, you know, one thing, obviously, the pandemic probably showed us be more kind to each other and understand. And I still think for the MedCom community it would be great to have a platform where you can share uh, problems and discuss your issues. That's me. I try to keep to my 10 minutes. <laughs> Christina, uh, amazing whistle-top tour through uh, so much uh, material. Uh, we, we will reflect on this, uh, whether there could be some platform where, where we could all meet. That's an interesting idea. Um, I mean, we found the doctor's mess where you just go in and just talk about whatever you like to talk about. Um, and, you know, you might even say, oh, you know, I can't manage this workload. Perhaps somebody is there who has nothing to do. So I think that would be great. 
Christina, uh, we, we all applaud what you're having to cope with at the present time. And uh, thank you for taking the time to, um, if, you, if you haven't got time to sort of hang around for, uh, uh, for um, towards the end of the afternoon to take some questions, but we do understand. Not in the quiz, not, <laughs> they're just too complicated. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Christina. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm now gonna call on um, Christian Hamby, Christian, I hope you're here somewhere uh, that we can speak to you. Um, Christy, uh, um, Christian is a, a very interesting individual uh, who wears uh, many different hats. Um, so he describes himself uh, as a geek. Um, he is a runner and he lives in Milton Keynes. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, and he runs a very interesting um, small company where he supports lots of different, uh, lots of different companies uh, with their IT needs. And he also has a lot of um, uh, thoughts on, uh, on good health and um, uh, keeping yourself sane at home. Um, so uh, Christian, I hope that you are there somewhere and um, you can uh, perhaps unmute yourself and make yourself known to us. Very kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? I'm just double checking and second guessing myself. Fabulous. Uh, my name is Christian and yeah, I run a freelance geek. Uh, is a, I'm a self-confessed geek. I, I kind of go big or go home on many things in my life and I used to kind of push back against it, but you know what? I just embrace my inner geek now. So as uh, yeah. Steve and Peter know, uh, yes, I'm a runner, I'm afraid. Went big or went home on there. Um, been a big three years almost now of health and well-being for me but I've been working for myself as a freelancer for eight ten years working from home um, secretly I'm actually a chemist by original training so pharma is kind of my second home um, so it's nice to be back in and amongst medcoms um, and it is just me so I'm actually quite positive through uh, lockdown. Um, this is me through Christine's uh, talk just gone was yeah yeah all of those things I've been experiencing and going through. Um, it's not been easy you know I've worked from home and the last nine months have been 24-7 and a complete change so I think being kind to yourself through some of this is something to think about. Now as we move into this um, I'm going to kind of take you through as quickly as I can because uh, I'm terrible I'll ramble away all day long. Um, my kind of top questions I've been asked through lockdown in and around IT as well as home environment and touching on a lot of other things that we've already spoken about today. So um, I also feel the pressure as I didn't get to test my slides earlier. So hopefully we go straight into a seamless, you can see my slides and off we go. Peter's nodding, thank you so much. Um, so working from home or living at work, let's just go through and take a look. Um, none of this is black and white there because we are individuals, but I wanna give you some thoughts, some places to challenge preconceptions and kind of push to make life easier for you. So you can forget about IT because ultimately that's where the fun comes is, can we move past it? So the first question that always comes up when we are working from home without doubt is, if I, there you go, the internet. We've talked about it already today. Short, sweet answer. If you can get fiber optic broadband in your home and you are working from home, do it hmm. in a heartbeat. Don't even think about it, just get it done. It's gonna make the single biggest difference if you can get it. Um, something else to look out for, watch out for those sneaky broadband providers. They love to sell us broadband on download speeds, 10, 20, 40, 60, 80, outside of the UK, thousand, all these kind of things they love to sell us on. But the one to watch out for is actually your upload speed. That's the important bit. And I think uh, Rebecca and a couple of the others touched on this with the interviewing and working from home. The thing that's gonna cause you problems isn't your download speed because you can all watch BBC iPlayer and Netflix and all these kind of things very easily. You struggle with your videos and it's because the video signal needs to be sent from your computer out to the world. And that's all about uploads. If you're not on fiber optic, as a general rule, you're running an upload speed of half a megabyte or less. There's your problem. So switching to fiber optic, you want upload speeds of any number, ideally. Get it better, make it double figures if you can. So 10 or more is fabulous. I'm on a 60-20 line. So I have 60 down, 20 up. It's fantastic. 
Now, I appreciate you can't do that for everybody. It's not always possible, but think outside of the box, 4G, 3G, using somebody else's internet, um, relocating yourself for that important call, whatever it is, there are ways around this. There's satellite broadband, you can bounce it off neighbors' houses and do these. And there's a lot of rural development projects taking this through. Keep pushing and don't take no for an answer because somewhere along the lines, you can generally get a yes. And it's normally a number, not a yes or a no. Once we've got your internet sorted, if that's good, oh, we can't make it any better. The next kind of 1.2 uh, is always about Wi-Fi or internet. And the answer is plain and simple, plug in a cable. I don't care if you've got the latest BT Halo or anything else, you can tell me how wonderful your Wi-Fi is. Wi-Fi is not perfect, plug in a cable if you can do it. Um, I, a lot of these things you're going to have me talk about today is tested not just on me as the geek, but my other half is working in our living room at the moment. Um, and I have a cable, a 30 meter cable running through to the other room so that she's on a Skype call on a cable, even though my router is here. Um, we're in a small flat. We're in a tight space. Run a cable if you can. Um, you can go on Amazon. You can get up to 50 meters. They're cheap you know, 30, 40 quid, 30, 40 euros. They're not a lot of money. Just do it. It will make the biggest difference to your day-to-day -day working environment to run a cable. If you can't run a cable, meshed networks is the next thing to aim at. If you want to know more, there's a nice little link on the slide. It's to an article I've written about explaining this in a much more time than we've got now at this precise moment. So plug in the cable. From there, we then kind of move into the desk environment. Do I buy a laptop? Do I have a desktop? What have I got at home? What does it look like? Um, challenge preconceptions. Why worry about whether you've got a laptop or a desktop? Have both. There's no excuse that you can't use an external mouse, an external keyboard, a big screen, a little screen, multiple screens, most modern devices. And I say devices, iPads, phones, laptops, desktops, whatever you want, you can generally make them much more functional to get these things done and make it comfortable. So I'm talking to you on a laptop at the moment um, and you'll see some pictures of this later on. So uh, challenge it and it doesn't have to be done expensively. It can be done ergonomically. You can create your own working environment that's comfortable for you. Um, if you like clicky clacky keyboards, I know we've got writers as an audience. So you guys are normally very sensitive to keyboards, whether it be from RSI issues, you know, clicky clacky. Look to the gaming industry, interestingly. Look for their recommendations on keyboards because those gamers are spending 12, 14, 18 hours a day using keyboards and they normally want really good responsive, nice keyboards. Amazing thing to do. But challenge your perceptions of what you've got now and what you can create in your environment. We then from there start looking at the surrounding and we've touched on this, sitting or standing, get some movement in, all these kind of things. I'm standing as I'm talking to you now and I personally explored this. Uh, I am a runner, I have done my yoga this morning. Thank you, Christine, there was me nodding all the way through. I've done 30 minutes of yoga. I schedule it by the way, I schedule my day and make that time important and I start it before my day. I'm also learning some things. So I also schedule that before my day starts or through my day as a treat and a reward for doing great productive work. But I start my day with yoga. Um, it hurts, but it's great. And I can then move through the day. Do you sit or do you stand? I've done a lot of experimenting, N equals one on this one, I'm afraid, but I've been using myself to work out what's right. My latest iteration before the current setup was buy the most uncomfortable chair I can physically find anywhere. And it was a wooden stool with no um, comfort on it at all. My overriding results that come out the other side of it is ultimately there is no right or wrong chair or sit or stand for me it's come down to movement is key and that solid stool meant that I was never comfortable enough to be slouching or collapsing in my chair I was always wanting to move it forced me to stand it forced me to sit it forced me to go and make a cup of tea just to get my some feeling back in my bottom um so again, I don't have a, divert, a, a specific answer, but you can create these environments. Um, you can get, uh, here you go, here's my desk. We can take a look. This is my desk, there's nothing glamorous. I haven't tidied it up. There's even a dirty tissue on it for you because I want you to see my desk. I'm by a window, again, thank you, Christine. Um, 
I'm using a laptop with an external mouse, ma uh, mouse and keyboard. It's a standing desk. They are a bit rarer than rocking horse poo at the moment um, because the world and his wife all want to buy this stuff for working from home. But you don't have to go down these routes. Challenge perceptions. Use the textbooks you've got sat in the cupboard gathering dust. You can buy adapters for desks. I've even got a little fold out table I can put on there that becomes my traveling standing desk when I'm back to moving. Um, what I'm saying is, is you can push this and take it far beyond just an IT requirement and you don't have to spend a lot of money on this. Once we kind of move from environment and going through, we then move into sounds. How do I make myself look amazing? Uh, there's another gentleman on the call who also looks like a radio DJ who's speaking earlier. Um, I, you know, people ask me about my headphones and separate microphone. This is for another project. But also part of my job is to explore this and say, is it worth it in a COVID lockdown environment? Do we need, how do we get better sound? How do we make it so we don't hear so much background noise? All these kind of things. Do you need to spend hundreds of pounds on a pro DJ setup? The short, simple answer is no, you don't. These headphones, the white Apple ones that everybody knows and loves, and they've probably got six pairs of them in their cupboard somewhere. They're fantastic headphones. You've got them from your mobile phone that have normally got microphones built into them. Plug them in, use them. It will make the biggest difference to the sound quality. They're two, three, four pounds to buy a pair of USB headset on Amazon. It doesn't take a lot. Uh, pro tip from my other half. She didn't know this. She loved this fact. If you look at a three and a half mil headphone jack, if it has two lines on it, it's a headphone only. If it has three lines on it, it means it's got a built-in microphone. Most computers will take a microphone into the headphone jack so you can plug those in and you can have whichever ones you like. Number five kind of steps away, but is one of the biggest topics I've been speaking about all the way through COVID. And I'm gonna to touch on this very quickly because this is the biggest headache for people in IT, in my opinion, on the planet at the moment is dealing with passwords. And I'm gonna go against what most IT people will tell you. And I'm gonna encourage you at this stage because ultimately it's nice to be at home. And I don't know about you, I love stationery. There's a really easy way to tackle passwords and you've got an opportunity whilst being at home where you haven't got somebody looking over your shoulder to do these things, write them down. Nothing more complicated than that. If you want to go down password manager routes, if you want to use electronic documents, we can talk about it. We can discuss the ins and the outs. But the trick to dealing with passwords whilst working from home is have them all collated and written down definitively. The stress that will come off your shoulder of, oh my God, what's the password for this? I've got to log into Teams. I've got a call now. I've got this and it needs me to sign out of that and sign into this. Just have them written down because then it's a copy and paste um, method. You just go, yeah, okay, it's that. No, it's that. Oh, no, no, I've typed it in wrong. Caps lock was on. Great, I'm in and you're done. That again will remove a whole load of day to day stress for you in terms of dealing with it. Privacy. Dum, dum, dum. IT often talks about privacy and security and all these things. I'm not actually going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about my own real world experiences that we've already touched on that. I have a theory around Zoom fatigue, uh, this idea that we're on video camera all day and this idea of turning cameras off on those. I've now got myself to a point where I can spend eight hour a day in front of a video camera. I'm tired, but no more tired than I am being in a training room for eight hours on a day to day basis. And my theory is, is it's all about privacy and creating a working environment. So I have this lovely background. It is just a photographic background on a piece of string hung up. But you all think I look like I'm in an amazing black screen kind of cave somewhere. The reason I have this is actually the chaos of my home is there. But I don't know if you found yourself, if you're on these calls, you find that people drift and kind of start investigating, oh, what's Peter got on his bookshelf behind him? And you start asking these questions. And I found it, I was in a heightened state of sensation of being constantly aware that people were looking at me. And my other half is the same. So what we've done is we've come up with this idea of creating temporary environments that allow us to live in our home but create a temporary workspace she has one of these um, wooden screens that she puts up behind her which is decorated with christmas decorations at the moment otherwise i would have taken a picture i have this background i've tried freestanding um, zoom backgrounds we've seen it on a couple um today anything to just create an environment where you are able to relax just like you would in a training room 
Next question. Which platform do I use? Teams, Skype, Zoom, WebEx. What platform should I choose for doing these video conferencing things? Here's a little bit of inside baseball. I'm an IT professional. I use all of them. Um, and actually, what I'm going to encourage you to do is move past the technology. Don't worry about which platform you're using. That's the nuances and understanding some of the things. Get used to your own environment, whatever's thrown at you. Do you know where the sound settings are on your computer? Do you remember if it's a really important call with CEO of the company to reboot your computer before you go into that call? Just to give yourself, set yourselves up for success rather than set yourselves up with worrying about which platform you're using. Have you got your microphone in just like I did? By the way, I did reboot through this call and I still hit problems with my mic and it all kicking through. It happens. Don't worry. We've all done it. We can put music on. We can have a cup of tea. People don't mind a two minute break whilst you do it. And if you do any presentation training, people will tell you, be comfortable with that silence. It's the same kind of concept. Don't panic. None of us are worrying. We're not judging you because you take two minutes longer to get yourself set up and connected. We've all been there. It's fun. So yeah, don't worry about which platform. Deal with the ones that they go with. For myself day to day, I just choose the platforms that my clients feel most comfortable using because I want to move past technology and I want to talk to that individual about what's stressing them out, what's causing them a problem and getting that fixed. Back up. Again, IT backup, triplicate, three copies of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done lots of talks on this and I'm very happy to talk to you about backup. I'm hoping everybody here is running backups. Probably going to find there's some of you that aren't. But that's actually not what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about a COVID specific, and it's highlighted this, this backup plan, particularly if like me, you are a freelancer or you work for yourself or you're responsible for your IT budget. What do you do when, if your computer goes pop? tomorrow, two minutes before your call, you can't go to John Lewis at the moment and buy a laptop off the shelf. You can go online and order one, but it's a week to two weeks lead time at the moment. So what do you do during these extenuating circumstances? Now, don't get me wrong, this is the same conversation I was having before COVID. It's just exasperated at the moment. For me, it's always planning for the worst and hoping for the best. It, Create a plan, get yourself a piece of paper, sit down with a nice cup of coffee, get yourself sorted and go, right, if my computer goes, here's my plan. I'm going to go and grab that spare one from the cupboard. When was the last time I turned it on and made sure it's updated? Oh, that's a good job to do on a Friday afternoon or a Monday morning just for some positive procrastination. Um, if I don't have a spare computer, what are my options? Where can I get these things from? How old's my computer? Do I need to be worrying about this? Well, let's push some boundaries again. Can I do my day-to-day -day work on my mobile phone? Yes, I can run I can run FaceTime, Skype, Teams, Zoom. Yeah, okay, that gets me good. It's a bit awkward to hold. Cool, get myself a little tripod, no problems at all. Can I connect a keyboard? Almost certainly. Most smartphones will take a Bluetooth keyboard. Well, suddenly I'm up and running. Okay, it's horrible, but I can type emails, I can attend calls, and I can probably troubleshoot and deal with what I need. But just pushing that, if you've got a tablet or an iPad, you know, that's taking you to another level. There is, you can use a mouse with one of those things. You can plug them into an external monitors, but just create yourself your own fallback plan so that when it happens, you're as cool as a cucumber. You go, yeah, it's annoying. I want to scream. But it's fine. I have a plan. I can get that device and I can carry on working. And then I can go back and have a glass of wine of an evening and have a laugh with your other half about it. And know that in three days, your computer's turning up and you have already backed up. If all else fails, my number one tip. Make sure you've got good coffee in the house. Or tea, as I got corrected yesterday. Um, I'm a massive geek, uh, as I've said before. I got so obsessed with coffee, I trained as a barista just for fun. Uh, I'm also into supporting uh, small businesses who are doing amazing things. If you love coffee, check out jamesgourmetcoffee.com. I am not sponsored. I just happen to love his business and his coffee. It's beautiful artisan roasted uh, coffee. If you like tea, postcard teas. Uh, it's a guy called Tim in London, Europe's largest importer of rare and exotic trees. Treat yourself. You deserve it. You're working bloody hard and delivering and having a great time and doing good stuff. Um, 
That's me. Um, thank you so much for listening to my crazy ramblings. In line with what some of you have also said about your water cooler, I don't have a water cooler. It's me talking to myself. I do, however, have a booking system for my diary so people can just drop by. Book yourself in for a coffee. If there's something you want to have a one-on-one with, come and have a chat. It doesn't cost anything. It's a way I break my day up by just talking about stuff and drinking coffee. Thank you very much, guys. Gosh, wow. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christian. Um, the, the freelance geek, uh, you were lots of fun. I uh, really enjoyed that. Lots of useful tips in there. Uh, I will check out the coffee. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, stick around if we, if you can, for some maybe some short questions afterwards. Um, our last, but by no means least, uh, presenter this afternoon uh, is Ian Smith. Um, Ian's going to be talking on, on why I've had enough with this long, this this working from home rubbish. Why I've had enough with this working from home rubbish. Uh, Ian is a very interesting individual. Uh, he's a consultant and a mentor, a to coach, worked with many many big companies. Um, and he has helped to, over the last five years uh, to um, get remote workforces working, improving productivity, and lots of other good things. Um, and obviously, COVID has made his skills uh, particularly, um, uh, particularly important. Um, he, he, he tells me he speaks quickly. Uh, and uh, so um, all the topics he's going to cover, including neuroscience, biology, and philosophy of this topic, uh, we're going to get uh, a, a kind of a, a storm of information, I'm guessing. Ian, are you there? Yeah, hi, Stephen, can you hear me? Absolutely, loud and clear. And can you see my slides by any chance? Yes, we can see your slides. Wow, so if I change it, then something will happen, is that right? Let's have a little look. Absolutely, go for it. Great, I certainly will. And if not, then Christian can help me out. Okay, so, um, wow, it's sort of doing it automatically. This is great, I love it. Okay, so why have I had enough of this working from home rubbish? Well, because I'm a smart working consultant for half of my time, as Stephen said, and this isn't smart working. We were mostly, I understand in your industry, not, not always and not everyone, but mostly people were rocking into offices and doing work. And, you know, with all the inefficiency and madness that that brings, and now suddenly we're all working from home with all the inefficiency and madness that that brings. And so early days when, um, I, you know, I've seen a number of surveys, the one we went through earlier here today and in various other companies, you know, many people thought this was going to be great. Look, here we are uh, living the dream, you know, sleeping late. I don't even have to get dressed possibly, you know, save a few hours of commuting time. You know, no, you know, my gosh, for C C Christian going from Milton Keynes to London, that's probably 50 quid return a day. Madness. And a little shout out to Rob Davis, saving all that money on wasabi and pret. I think he said that earlier on today. So, um, and real dedicated time to do work. A bit like when I used to work from home, when I had that specially most important thing to do. And I would you know, never think of going into the office to do that, you know, or if I had to do it in, in the office, I'd be early or late or at the weekend, you know, all of the money that's been spent by companies um, to create office space and the most important work is nearly always done somewhere else because no interruptions and no delays, no points failures at Clapham Junction, no traffic jams on the M whatever. Oh, this was gonna be a great thing, except for for many, as we've heard, and as you can see, this is just a list from various surveys that I've done uh, in groups, uh, and you could just read down that list. Um, uh, and, and I won't, it's really bad practice to read lists, so I'm not gonna do that. You can probably read quicker than me, and you've scanned down it by now, most of you will be on too many flipping quizzes. I'm really sorry for the person who's about to do a quiz. I, didn't, I could, I could have edited that out had I realized, but I didn't have time. Anyway, so uh, people, you know, finally though, I hang on, people are saying they miss personal time during their commute. Today, these slides are bang up to date for you, Stephen. Today in the Times, here is a headline. Get back on the commute. It's just the ticket, it's for you, it's great for you. Is that really true? And in fact, there's such a desire for having a space between work and home that these guys, Microsoft have, are coming up with some sort of virtual commute, um, a process that allows you to speed, slow down from your day before you enter your house again and get sucked into the minutiae of doing the washing up or whatever it might be. But let me go back to that list. 
that first set of the stuff on the list here, I never finish on time. My diaries are washed with meetings. I get more emails than ever. My manish was rubbish face to face and is worse remotely. Well, actually, most of that stuff is just true of before COVID. If you had a rubbish manager then and you've got a rubbish manager now, it is worse, but it was bad anyway. Email, none of us have ever been taught really how to use email. That training course that never happened. You know, when do you CC someone in? What do you do if you're CC? Are you a spy if you BCC? This is all madness. And email was there as messenger and as all these other things, WhatsApp and text and mobile phones, you know, even the facts probably, all there to save us time and make it more efficient for us. But actually the reverse is true. And then we look at another area. I miss the routine. Well, luckily, you know, we heard earlier, Christine, I think, was talking to us about uh, the routine. And um, yeah, so maybe we can, we can do something about that. And then, oh yeah, all that noise from my family and neighbors. I came across this term while I was uh, um, working with a, a group of people in early April, misophonia. Yeah, I won't um, read the slide, but basically it's a, an enhanced connection between your limbic brain and your senses. And what it means is you can't stand other people's noises. That's sort of okay in an office. Thomas Kilsman and he, uh, their work around conflict were really clear. In an office space, you probably you know, 80% likely not to um, get into conflict people because it's just not worth it. But unfortunately at home, you're 80% likely to get into conflict. So if you don't like your husband clicking his pen or the way that your wife eats an apple, you know, it might drive you crazy and you can't go anywhere. There's no concept of you having the commute to get away and then coming back later. You're living with it. And when I was running some sessions early in April and May, you know, a lot of people were talking about the noises. You know, someone said to me, you cannot believe how noisy my husband is emptying the dishwasher while I'm on a call. It's almost like, you know, it's the only piece of housework he does and he does it to demonstrate to everyone in the world how diligent he is as a supportive husband. Oh, just driving me crazy. So what can we do about this stuff? So here's what I think we can do. And here's what I tell my clients to do, although I never give advice. I never give advice because no one wants advice. It would always be from my frame of reference. I would be guessing, it's really bad. What I do instead is I help people think things through. And what we get to often, and so this is where I've got to with most of my clients is talking about control. Now here's a guy, here's one of my favorite guys, Epictetus. Now we're going way back here. This is, you know, before any technology really that, uh, Christian would uh, recognize. Um, and what he said was, I'm really worried, he said, I'm translating directly from the Greek. And he said, I'm really worried that I'm, I'm, I'm concerning myself with things that are out of my control. And this is making me ill. And therefore, and he wrote many treaties. You can find a penguin book with all of his stuff for about four quid, I think. Um, and uh, what the things he was worried about he was worried about the state of his nation's government. Yeah, okay, that's a bit of a constant. He was worried about his health. Yeah, that, that's okay. Except that he didn't think he could control it in the way that we understand now if we eat five a day and we exercise and we drink less, all those things. Um, he was also worried about the speed of change, which has often concerned me because what on earth was going on in the speed of change in AD 100? But what he, what he was really clear about was that if he didn't do that, and Stephen Covey nicked this, by the way, and he turned it into these circles of control in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, what, what, what the essence is, is if we only focus on the stuff that we can control and ignore the rest, actually this plays to our mental health and it plays to our productivity. I mean, pretty clear where we should focus on the stuff that we control, but do we? And are we now? I mean, are you watching the news more? Are you reading what's going on on Twitter? Are you on social media? I'm reading stuff at the moment that's telling me just to get off social media. There is no positive benefit at all. And I'm beginning to be inclined to agree with it. It really affects my ability to do, and to quote Cal Newport, deep work. So, okay, if I'm gonna take control, and actually I wanna work in harmony with my mind and my body, because that's all I've got. Here are the things, and I'm gonna break these down, uh, conscious that there's a quiz starting any time now. Um, do the most important things first, and I'll tell you why. Divide your time into 90 minute chunks, because that's how our biology works. 
uh, build times when you can prevent interruptions and take energizing breaks. So we're going to share the slides. I'm going to run through bits of these. So um, the first thing I would say is why is it important to, um, yeah, neuroscience tells us this. It's our prefrontal cortex. If you exhaust it on pointless other people's priorities, like emails first thing in the morning, you ruin the most incredible part of your brain. And so without talking for any length on that, you can find out loads of stuff. And David Rock is your reference, massive amounts of research, and you'll find loads of stuff online. The essence is do the most important stuff first. Here, here's what I talked about, ultradian rhythms, work in 90 minute chunks and take 20 minute breaks. If you do a 90 minute chunk and then you carry on, you, you ruin your ability to have a second pristine and effective 90 minute chunk. But if you take a break, go for a jog, go for a walk, dance for 20 minutes to 1970s earth, wind and fire songs, doesn't matter what it is. But if you do that, your next 90 minutes can be as good. And I have some clients now who are able to do four or five times of 90 minute effort a, a, a day. And they're actually getting their week's work done by lunchtime Tuesday, which means they can spend the rest of the week on pointless drivel of all the other stuff that they have to do. Um, here's uh, some stuff from, uh, from the same guy, Tony Schwartz. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly click through and just show you this, uh, which is, if you can work on this side of the um, grid between performance and renewal, this is your 90 minutes and 20 minute break or sometimes 30, um, that's, that's where you wanna be. Um, we've got to avoid interruptions. Look at all this stuff that prevents us getting work done, including you and your phone. The average American, by the way, checks their phone every three minutes. How often do you check your phone? Um, Multitasking, uh, again, that we're gonna share the slides, but look, it does really bad stuff. It can drop your IQ by 10 points. I was told early on by Stephen as he briefed for me, me, me for this uh, call, that you're all really super clever people. So probably you can afford that drop of 10 points, but I work with lots of people who can't. And what's the impact of all the interruptions? I mean, here's some great research. It can take 25 minutes to get back in the zone and people on average are losing a quarter of their day being distracted by madness. So how can you make this all happen? I'm saying at the end of each day, finish 15 minutes early and decide the most important thing that you need to get done next day and then book it into your schedule and book 90 minute chunks and put, like Christian, put your yoga in your diary so a prompt comes up and reminds you turn off your email tell people that if they want to get hold of you urgently email is a rubbish way of doing it and and i tell my clients i won't see email if you send it to me um except for when i look and i check like first class and second class post those of us who are old enough to remember the second of those i check them twice a day and that way i can do it within a sensible work schedule without affecting all the really important stuff I've got to do. And finish at the time you said you would. So finally, a call to action. Here we go. As a result of listening to someone like me or any of the other people who've talked today and given you top tips, do you know what? The percentage of people who actually do something is shocking. It's this. I, I don't upsell many courses if only 5% of people do stuff. So I always end to a call for action. And brilliantly, this will play to what uh, the guys who've organized this have said. They want stuff in the chat. So please type in the chat now a commitment, one thing that you'll do as a result of any of the stuff that you've heard today. Just one thing. Let's see that chat go on fire and it'll give some really good data as to the effectiveness of the various sessions in this call.